Childhood nostalgia is a funny thing. It can really color your perception of how you viewed something by mixing it in with happy memories of the good old days. So your pre-adolescent mind can trick your future adult self into thinking Mortal Kombat The Journey Begins was awesome, only to watch it and go, uh... Or maybe you can go back and find something that you hated as a kid is pretty cool as an adult. Like cussing! Oh, can't do that. I try not to let nostalgia play a factor in how I review things by just looking at them how I would if I only saw them today for the first time. With new eyes and a fresh look, I want to go back to a topic from my own childhood. Superhero games based on insanely collectible toys, which is admittedly a very specific niche considering there's like, only two of them. Uh, maybe three. But before we get into the history behind these two, I want to talk about this video being made possible by our gracious sponsors, another highly collectible and addictive game. Raid Shadow Legends is a dark fantasy epic RPG that I'm sure you've heard of by now. In fact, it's so popular it's had over 15 million downloads in the last six months alone. Raid is one of the top three ranked RPGs on the Google Play Store, and it's just been nominated as a finalist for Google Play's Best of 2019 User's Choice Award. It's a hero collection turn-based game with over 400 champions for you to collect and personally customize. You can play it and assemble a team from 16 factions, discover 13 cool locations, and raid with your friends in a clan. And the best part, it's totally free to play! Some extra cool features in the game are 14 new champions added every month to keep that collection growing, progression rewards like free champions and equipment just for learning how to play, and once you completed those missions, you'll get one of the best legendary champions in the game, the Arbiter. This game is growing super fast and has even more updates coming down the line so you'll never get bored. Go to the video description, click the special links, and you'll get 50,000 silver and a free epic champion as part of the new player program to start your journey. Good luck, and I'll see you there. Alright, where was I now? Alright, oh, complaining about a game for 10 year olds. But first, context! This is Darth Vader. Or at least a very cutesy and kid-friendly version of him from the toy line called Galactic Heroes that first started in the mid-2000s. Just about every kid I knew had at least one or two of these things, and even though I wasn't that big into Star Wars, I had... I had a lot of them. They're like Funko Pops, except you can actually play with them and they aren't all the same default template. Do it. They were such a hit that they spawned in a new territory by licensing other franchises. So these simple, cute looking, not very poseable toys started to take on the likeness of Indiana Jones, Transformers, and one day, Marvel superheroes. I collected all of the above, including the really rare ones that you had to get by sending in special box tops. I was obsessed with these things as a kid. The Superhero Squad series in particular because I was such a huge comic fan growing up. They weren't just a favorite for years truly, the Superhero Squad toys were so huge that they spawned a cartoon and multiple video games. And I was the prime target audience at the time given how young I was. And yet, despite my love and adoration for these things and my eternal quest to bug my parents to hunt down every single one that existed, I didn't like the game. I especially didn't like the show, and that's a topic for another day, but I played the game once and then traded it in shortly after. A few years later, Superhero Squad toys started dying down and going unsold in stores until they stopped producing them entirely. One day, I knew for sure that I had collected my last one. And I'm sure if I ran down the checklist, I'd probably realize I have all but three or four of them. By then, I was getting older and stopped playing with toys as much. I was too busy at school, starting to take notice of girls, and entering the early stages of teenage angst that I'm pretty sure I'm still mixed up in at 21. Around 2013 though, LEGO acquired about all the licenses for Marvel that they could ever want and went full force with toys and merchandise to hype up the MCU renaissance after Avengers came out. And very quickly after that, they put out LEGO Marvel Super Heroes, a game I bought on day one and played day in and day out until I got 100% completion. I've played it several times since then and I have so many fond memories with this game. That got me thinking. I love Superhero Squad toys, but I didn't like the game. I didn't care about LEGO Marvel toys, but I adored the game. So today I want to explore and tackle the question of why this game is such a nostalgia trip, and this one's a forgotten memory despite being based on brands with totally opposite effects. Maybe along the way we'll learn. How not to make a superhero game for kids. So both of these games start out pretty similarly, a smiley plastic vision of the good old Marvel Universe where a cosmic accident gets everyone's attention by leaving a series of super powered MacGuffins all over the place causing Doctor Doom to take notice and send his legion of bad guys to go pick them up. While Iron Man and his crew try to play keep away. 
Both have linear gameplay segments where two players explore levels, fight hordes of bad guys, and solve admittedly easy puzzles, and beat up Abomination in the first level. On the surface, these almost seem like the same game, but the devil is in the details and the execution plays a big part in why both got such a different reaction from me. Let's look at Superhero Squad first since it came out a few years before LEGO Marvel. The game's art style is strange and a little off-putting. The characters aren't based on the cartoon based on the toys, they're just... based on the toys to the point of looking really plastic and stiff and mimicking the facial expressions the figures had in these motion comic style cutscenes. Even in gameplay, they strike poses just like the figures during in-game animations. I have a few theories as to why. The positive one being that maybe they just wanted an art style where these characters look good in 3D since the 2D designs from the show might have looked a little odd. Or the other one being that there just wasn't a lot of communication about the character designs from the show during development. The game only came out over a month after the premiere of the animated show, so they were probably rushing to get it out the door in time. This makes it feel really strange as a tie-in because it doesn't really feel or look much like the show despite having their voice actors and a bit of their character art in the menus. So it fits in this nebulous space of not belonging anywhere. It's too much like the show to feel like a tribute to the toys, and it's not enough like the show to feel like a good tie-in for that. Not only does it feel rushed and out of place in history, it just feels rushed and out of place in every other way too. The game itself feels like a clunky mess that was pretty irritating as a kid. The combat is extremely button mashy, with very low input on how much or how little damage you're doing to enemies. Your first instinct is to just hit square until they fall down, but what happens if you hit triangle? Uh, nada. But if you hit triangle in a combo, suddenly it does something. Circle is a long distance attack that most enemies just block, but occasionally you can tag them with it and knock them back when you're getting overwhelmed. The character movement is slow and stiff, which is only accented by a camera that you can't control and you're always at the mercy of when it decides to change in the middle of combat. None of the main heroes feel unique in any way, and all play the same way. There's no special scenarios that can only be solved by one character, no gameplay mechanics built around their special talents. You can play through the game with two characters and it doesn't really make any difference which ones you pick. They break up the gameplay every once in a while with quick time event sequences and these are entertaining if only for the amount of ways you can choose to fail them and watch the hero fall on his face or splatter in a comical way. The level design really lacks any creativity or imagination. The missions are all very short and small, often with repeating architecture or very bland scenery. You spend a lot of this game in cramped, dark hallways, which is disappointing considering how fun and colorful everything looks at first glance. It often pushes you into doing very repetitive tasks, like fighting wave upon wave of enemies until the game decides you can progress protecting some random soldiers who are doing menial tasks like hacking a computer, or you'll just end up running through very samey stretches of corridors trying to collect an item that'll open the door to a hallway where you do the same thing over again. God, it's like they use the same design philosophy as Destiny. Let's not also forget moments where the progression becomes very difficult because they decide to be obtuse and pick some random object in the environment that has to be destroyed in order to leave the room. Which wouldn't be so bad if the hit detection on some items wasn't so broken. I can absolutely see a younger kid getting frustrated and bored with this game very quickly, and it's not challenging because it requires a lot of thought or skill, but because the game is constantly testing your patience before you lose interest and turn it off. Alright, since you're determined to do it anyway, write your comments now because I was so harsh in the game. A few dozen of you do it every time. If there's anything I can praise this game for, it's that they fixed Galactus's face from the toy. Jesus, he looks like Thomas the Tank Engine Devourer of Worlds. But otherwise, the lazy game design, non-committal style and tone, bland gameplay, and ugly visuals make this one of the lesser Marvel games out there. Let's compare this to LEGO Marvel. Rather than an infinity sword, it's a silly but appropriate case of cosmic LEGO bricks getting spread throughout various Marvel landmarks. There are more levels, more cutscenes, more actual boss fights instead of just pushing the bad guys out of bounds ten times, and more memorable Marvel locations. I immediately have to appreciate how the game looks visually. Everything is so bright and colorful for the majority of the game, but the lighting and tone can change depending on the mission. 
They even did the dark and stormy prison break at the raft before Spider-Man got to it. And this little side mission with Daredevil and Elektra feels like an old Frank Miller comic. You may notice going back to this one that a lot of looks, characters, and locations feel very MCU inspired. Which is not surprising at all anymore because that's become the default for everything. Comics are just advertisements for the movies and shows now. I miss the old days when they were only advertisements for toys. At least the comics were dictating how the figures looked and not the other way around. Although we're also talking about two games designed after toys. This is becoming a weird meta chicken and egg thing and I'm confusing myself. But hey, at least they gave special attention to X-Men and Fantastic Four and even a little bit of Andrew Garfield Spidey since this was before he got canned and Marvel started cracking down and removing those characters from everything until they got the rides back. This is the second coolest boss fight with the Sentinel. Anyway, we've all played LEGO games at one point or another because they keep enveloping IPs and franchises we like, dating all the way back to the only way to make the Star Wars prequels enjoyable. They're sort of like Telltale games, just coming out constantly with the same gameplay formula applied to a new brand each time. The difference being that these games are successful and like, more than three of them are good. I think if there's anything that speaks to the longevity of these games is that they're just good games. Like, they're fun and well-designed, usually. The two-player co-op feels useful and well-implemented because they actually give both characters something to do. Iron Man can solve puzzles Hulk can't, and vice versa. Reed Richards can use his powers to pull off crazy moves that Captain America can't because he's not a scary rubber stretchy man that's secretly evil in every timeline. What this does is make the character feel very useful and unique in some way instead of a big nuisance. What Superhero Squad didn't understand is that a co-op partner that doesn't do anything just feels useless when playing the game solo. You could have all these same missions with only the one character that appears in cutscenes, and it wouldn't affect a thing. While as in LEGO Marvel, you get to see every character pull off something special that only they can do. Which gives you a better sense of identity for each one. Sure characters fit in subcategories to agree, and a lot of them have the same powers, but they manage to do that in a way that feels fitting, so every character isn't just a palette swap on the model. Black Bolt has the same energy projection power as most characters, but it comes from his mouth and he has a screaming sound effect and a unique flying animation based on his costume. Venom has all the same powers as Spider-Man, but they also give you the option to choose between Topher Grace Virgin Venom and Chad Tom Hardy Venom mid-gameplay. And to be fair, a decent amount of these characters' power sets really are just a reskin of some other guy with one or two extra gimmicks. Don't even get me started on how there's too many damn Flashes and Spider-Men. I think something that makes the LEGO games in general feel so addictive is the amount of unlockables and progression within the game itself and how clearly and easily it's laid out what you need to do to get them all. I see a character select screen with god knows how many adorable plastic angular landmine schmucks in it, but it very quickly becomes apparent how I get the ones I want most. They're all just listed on the map from the very start. Wanna play as obscure Spider-Man villain that's always fleeing boss fights of the Beetle? Well, he's right over there. Just do this quick mini game and you're set. Let's see how Superhero Squad handles this. Play through the level to get the characters in the level. Alright, that works. That's just like the other thing. But what about all these other guys? Just play the level two more times. <sighs> yeah, that's fun. And again, it doesn't matter much anyway because half of them you can't play with in the story mode. Hell, even Spider-Man, who is dead center of the box art on the game cover, you have to unlock by finding all these tokens in the story mode. And you can't use him in the story either! I will, however, give a point to this game over LEGO Marvel in that he's voiced by Josh Keaton, while the LEGO version is voiced by Johnny Test of Friend or Foe fame. Both, however, are superior to... Wow! Your heads! My feet! Ugh. Another thing to praise LEGO Marvel for is the sheer amount of characters they threw in, giving special attention to a lot of the coolest ones, like a side mission and dialogue in the open world for Ghost Rider or Punisher. Even Deadpool is here and they really make you work for it to unlock him. Wow, this is the best Deadpool-related thing to happen in a video game in 2013. We can be a team! We gonna get fame, money... Don't forget the bitches. There's not gonna be fame, and there's not gonna be bitches. Okay, I didn't ask for any of this. I, I just want to be like everybody else. This game is just so weirdly packed with content between the fully explorable open world map and the great replay value on various levels once you go back with extra characters and powers. All these side objectives and unique encounters, all the time and care put into it. 
What separates these two most for me is that this one doesn't feel half-assed in any way whatsoever, which is surprising because these games sell like hotcakes and you'd think they'd get lazy every once in a while while making them. Especially attached to such a massive brand like Marvel, which pretty much guarantees it'll be a financial success. Just because it's made for kids doesn't mean it has to be mindless and lazy. Even some of the game's hundreds of puzzles can stump an adult every once in a while. LEGO Marvel has time and energy put into it, with an appreciation for every character included. The attention to detail makes it feel like a really genuine love letter to Marvel, and even if you're a bitter, angsty adult with bills to pay and a Twitter account full of political screaming in all caps that leave you feeling nothing but emptiness, you can still sit down and play this and feel like a kid again. Well, as this one feels like a rushed, haphazardly put together mess that was just designed to build hype for a cartoon rather than stand on its own. This lacks the same heart. God, I sound like Scorsese. But hey, maybe you liked it when you were seven years old, so you're still gonna write that comment about how it's actually an underrated gem, and I'm just mean and you had to be there, man, it was good for the time, even though I played it at the same age and didn't like it then either. That being said, if we just ignore the crap that resulted from it, I still love these charming little toys and I'd collect them again in a heartbeat if they came back in some form. No, not those lame Imaginex style knockoffs. I mean a proper return, unique poses and a billion costume variants and all. I only knew what Iron Man 2020 was because of this figure, and they still need to make one for slime!